Welcome everybody to the uh, panel discussion on the SPREP program and to get started I'd like each of our panelists to kind of introduce themselves quickly. I'm Robert Colson and I'm a professor at Texas A&M University. I'm Fred Steven, I'm professor of forest entomology at University of Arkansas. I'm Fred Hay, retired professor of forest entomology at NC State University and current director of the Forest Restoration Alliance. Jesus. <laughs> um, I'm Tom. No, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you can see where this is going. Right? So I'm Tom Payne, retired, uh, vice chancellor, uh, University of Missouri, dean of the College of Ag, Food, and Natural Resources, and professor emeritus of uh, plant sciences and natural resources. That's it. I'm just discussing. The all right, uh, discuss. Are we ready? Yeah, you're ready. Okay, uh, here's. We'll let right, Tom here, kick here. it off. Here. So here's the deal. We're 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 here to honor Bob Thatcher. Man, how many of you knew Bob? How many of you were, were born when Bob was alive? Just <laughs> 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 question. Come on, stay with it. This is an interactive session. <laughs> but a lot of you probably don't know all about Bob. Freddie. Uh, uh, Fred Stephen uh, shared with me the other day something that I'm going to kind of read through because I think it's it's interesting and important to really know about the guy. So Bob, you may not know, is Robert Clifford Thatcher, and he uh, I'm not going to read. He was the son and everything else. He was born in Boonville, New York, uh, in '29. Educated in the Boonville schools, uh, he went into the Marine Corps in 1946. How many knew he was a Marine? Yeah. Okay. Uh, served in the infantry for uh, quite a while, was in China, and discharged uh, from active duty in 48, and he had joined, he joined the inactive reserves. Then he entered Utica College in Syracuse University, transferred to SUNY, at, to the School of Forestry, uh, got his bachelor's in 1953, before some people in this room were born. Uh, his major was general forestry. He continued his studies in the College of Forestry, got a degree, uh, master's uh, in forest entomology. Uh, married Harriet, many of you knew Harriet. Um, and he had four kids, which I didn't realize. I thought he only had Tracy. He had uh, Thomas Lee, um, Richard, um, and then Susan and Tracy, uh, Christine. Uh, he was employed with the Forest Service, as you all know. He worked for a year in Forest Insect Survey uh, in seven of the Mid-South Mid states. Um, and he was headquartered in Gulfport, Mississippi, termite capital of the world. Uh, in 55, he transferred to Nacogdoches, and he worked in pine production, reproduction weevil, bark beetle problems uh, for the next eight years. And then in 63, he entered Auburn University uh, under a provision that the uh, feds had with the uh, 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 Training Act, and he got his PhD degree um, in 65. Um, started research on southern pine beetle at uh, Alexandria Forestry Center, Pineville. In 68, he transferred to D.C., where he had a stint as assistant chief of forest insect research. Uh, and then came back, as we all know, to be project leader uh, in Pineville after Bill Bennett retired uh, back in then. He sometimes taught as an instructor at Stephen F. Austin during those years. So Bob, as you all know, passed away last year. Rest in peace, that cool guy. So I knew Bob. Um, I met him probably in 1969, 1970, when I first went to Texas A&M University. And Bill Bennett was still project leader there, and Bob was in the project. Um, Southern Pine Beetle was acting up all over the South back in those days. The industry was uh, outraged by the fact that uh, there seemed to be no effect uh, of efforts to try and reduce it. And uh, they brought in the Boyce Thompson Institute for Plant Research out of Yonkers, New York. They had a project in Grass Valley, California, and uh, they established one in Sour Lake, Texas. And they brought this uh, German guy by the name of uh, Jean-Pierre Vite, and he established research teams in both locations. And, uh, and that's how 
lot of us kind of got tied into this. And I'll, I want to read uh, one thing first before I, I go on just a little bit further, and I don't want this to be a monologue at all. I'll try and get out of it with my, I'm working with an iPad, which I really don't know quite how to use, so be bear with me. I, I stored something on here that Jack Coster sent me, and I, I told Jack I would read it. Jack was going to be here today, and some things came up, and he was unable to make it. So this is uh, to Bob Thatcher, rest in peace. I'm so glad that the fearless foe of Fanny Frontalis is finally defeated. Uh, well deserved and long overdue, my association with Bob Southern Pine Beetle is a highlight of my professional life. We did good stuff together, got in lots of trouble, chased out of many brothels. <laughs> lots of trouble. Uh, Nacogdoches, <laughs> those of you who probably don't know, there were brothels in Nacogdoches. There are no longer there because Bob and I closed them down. That's all, of course, ad -lib. He told me I could add lead, by the way. So you have to figure out what's cost her and what's pain. I told him that this is what he gets for not coming. <laughs> Knowledge of the southern pine beetle, its biology, especially ecology factors and effects have been advanced to high levels in understanding because of Bob's leadership through the bark beetle program. And, and we'll all go into some detail about that. Uh, how warm are my memories of those Friday evening staff meetings with Bob at Harriet's house and Harriet fixing such great food. National headquarters for the expanded Southern Pine Beetle Research and Application Program in suburban Pineville, Louisiana did not really do justice to the grand scheme of Bob's program. Program's headquarters, headquarter campus itself got left out of the expanded part. A suite of two double wide trailers however, <laughs> did get to serve on intercom expenses and has simply raised the voice <laughs> with a tap on the wall. So that, that's, you know, actually, if you think about it, if our government in general would go back to those kinds of things, we could save billions of dollars <laughs> in air conditioning and everything like that. After all of the FBI background investigations to friends and non-friends, I fully expected a visit uh, to the National Headquarters campus by Jimmy Carter. I was prepared to have him autograph my personal copy of Alicia Frontalis by Bob Thatcher. I was on edge every day waiting, but that never happened. That was the only disappointment during my time with Bob as I became the application coordinator. Was he application or research? Anybody know? I think it was application. I thought that was odd. Her tell was the research, and that was really bass backwards because neither one of them knew about the other one. <laughs> but he said, my life's been blessed because of this. So uh, Jack cared a lot for Bob, obviously, and he sent that note, he regrets not being here. Uh, I want to say just a couple more words. Um, the way I got involved in this, and, and Colson and I were at Texas A&M together, Southern Pine Beetle was ravaging the South, as I already said. Industry was pissed. They were really upset with the Forest Service. At about that time, the, the feds were, the Forest Service was launching the three bug, big bug program. Tussock Moth in the west, Gypsy Moth northeast, Southern Pine Beetle in the south. They had a bill going through Congress to fund those at many millions of dollars over an extended period of time. <clears throat> the forest industry in the south was not going to underwrite that effort for the Forest Service unless the Forest Service engaged uh, university people. Plain and simple, that was the statement. And this was a uh, thing hit, uh, led by a lot of people, Temple East Tex and Kirby Lumber Company, some of the heavies that had big political contributions to the people who really controlled what was going on. And that was out of Mississippi primarily with Thad Cochran and Jamie Whitman and, and Stennis and those guys. And they were friends of ours in the, in the final analysis. But anyway, so what happened is Bob and I, we're going to uh, New Orleans to the southern uh, uh, headquarters, southern region headquarters, to form a uh, regional project on Southern Pine Beetle. Our department head, Perley Atkinson, said, you need a regional project on Southern Pine Beetle. And land grant universities, I don't know if you know, experiment stations have region, have projects on, on cotton, soybeans, whatever it is. So 
Atkinson said, you need one on this. Bob and I didn't know what they were, but he told us, he said, take an outline and show up at the meeting because nobody else would probably come with any ideas. And we got there, and there were people from the other land-grant universities plus Forest Service, and everybody interested in working together on this problem. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, camaraderie, I would say, and morale was really good. So anyway, we wound up becoming the leaders of the project by de facto, because we brought a piece of paper that had now. Honest to God, you come in the room with an idea and you're going to get the job. Well, that turned out to be really cool because going on at the same time, unbeknownst to us, was this effort of the Forest Service to launch the Southern Pine Beetle program and industry wasn't supporting it. Forest Service realized that they needed university participation and lo and behold was this little new project called S99, Southern Pine Beetle Regional Project. So I get a phone call from Bob Thatcher, and we become partners. We got several things happened that were really coincidental at the time. We just formed this project. The industry wanted university involvement. They could get it instantaneously organized. And they found Nixon's hand in the cookie jar, and Watergate hit. The Office of Management and Budget had locked up all allocations of resources. And once Watergate hit, funds started flowing out of OMB, and they funded this damn thing with three months left in the fiscal year, which meant we had three months to disperse $1.2 million <laughs> for Southern Pine Beetle Research. And Thatcher and I, Thatcher was program leader, I was research coordinator, we didn't have an application coordinator, and then we got Paul Buffum on. And the, and the structure of this program was very unique. Here you have 1.2 million or 2.1 or however it was, more money than any of us had ever worked with, given to us to disperse in three months. And the money had been released to the Northeast and the South Southern Forest Experiment Stations. So here these directors got chunks of dollars in their budgets, right? So naturally, they started allocating it, but they didn't understand that they were just banks and that the money was <coughs> authorized through the Undersecretary of Agriculture, Robert Long. Bob and I reported to the Undersecretary of Agriculture, and all the regions did was hold the money. So we had to go to the regions and tell them, get your hand out of the cookie jar, put the money back, we're allocating it. And that was, it was a little sensitive for a while, as you can imagine. And Bob, being a Forest Service employee, because he wasn't at the time, he worked he worked for the USDA at the time at, at this capacity, so he was a little, un, un, you know, a little sensitive about that. I didn't give a damn, I was a university guy, so I was the heavy in that thing. So we got the money put back. Bob and I traveled all throughout the South, meeting with department heads, with scientists, in some cases with presidents of universities to convince them to get their researchers to put in proposals to launch this program. And, uh, and they did. And it put, uh, the, I think, uh, I'll end by telling you this. I believe this was the most significant advancement towards forest entomology in the South in the history of forest entomology in the South. The infusion of those dollars not only brought people now there are generations of students that are out there as a result of this bit of funding. But the most significant thing it did, it brought everybody together. It brought industry people together, it brought Forest Service personnel together, and university people together. It was like one big happy family. I mean, and they worked together, the morale was good, and everybody was charging on doing great things. So the last thing I'll tell you is this. I've come to the Southern Forest Insect Work Conference the last three years because of these kinds of events. And I'm always, my, I'm always heartened by the level of camaraderie and morale and spirit that I see amongst the people who come here. You're like a big family. It's really, really important to keep that kind of emotion and commitment going, regardless of what in the hell our leadership is doing. As long as the work that's being done is solid and sound, it's always going to prevail. 
just don't get discouraged by the bullshit that's going on in our agencies and institutions around the country because the core of what's important is what everybody here is doing. So that's my two cents. Okay. Bob, you were kind of there at the inception. Yeah, let me uh, make just one anecdote to what Tom said. $1.2 million in 1970 was monstrous money. You could buy a pickup truck for $3,000. So the, the, it's, you, you really can't uh, appreciate how much money that really was. It was uh, an untold or unprecedented uh, infusion of money that had never been in, in well, never been anywhere in four cent a mile, but it certainly hadn't been, that kind of money had never been available for research in, in the South. So it was, it was monstrous money. And my, my take on it, um, uh, the, 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 the details that Tom just went through are uh, actually I've forgotten about them. The, the, the how how it began, but the uh, one I was already in place. I was working had a joint appointment with the Texas Forest Service and the Department of Entomology, and I was stationed over in Lufkin, and with the, with a charge to develop a research program in forest entomology over there. And so when this money. Um, Became a bit, well, there was a prelude to it also. Is, is that in the in the West, uh, there the, this uh, Dave Wood and um, Don Dalston and Ron Stark were trying to put together a, a bark beetle program, an expanded uh, bark beetle research program. And Tom and I hooked up with them, uh, went out there and visited their sites and, and what they, the kind of work that they were doing, and that ended up that the, the first money that I got out of it actually was an NSF grant to work on population dynamics of bark beetles that was a result of that uh, collaboration with them. Tom had a project that was funded through the Forest Service that was looking at pheromone behavior, uh, two different uh, sources of money. So we had, you know, as, as, as young assistant professors in the system, we had real money really quickly. Uh, and, and led a very luxurious life in terms of grant support for 10 years. And I wrote it out for another five years when we started building computer systems for planning and problem solving and decision making. So it was an unprecedented opportunity to do research. The, the, this is really a testimony to Bob Thatcher, so let me emphasize that. And then uh, all these personalities that uh, Tom mentioned that uh, worked as basically assistants to Bob were, were all young people. They didn't, none of them had any administrative experience at all. And so they made their bones working for Bob and, and responding to the model that he set up in terms of how administrators did business. There was integrity there, there was accountability. Uh, and all of those guys went on the, and I mentioned a, a few of them yesterday, uh, Tom. Uh, went on to become a vice chancellor and dean. Jack became the, the dean of the College of Forestry at uh, West Virginia. Uh, Bill Lushner, who was a prof when we met him, was a prof up at Virginia Tech as an economist. He became the head of the, the um, forestry program at Clemson. Uh, Garland Mason uh, worked with him. Garland became an AD uh, in the Forest Service, ended up out in, in Pacific Northwest Forest Range Experiment Station. So, there were a, a, a lot of really accomplished administrators that learned their trade from uh, being with Bob. And uh, I can tell you that the, the accountability, well, we had a lot of money, there was no question about that, but the accountability for what you did with that money was, was very harsh. I mean, they were, they were in our face <coughs> every four months there was to be somebody tra trouble by usually as Bob and Tom or someone that was working with them would come through and want a review of what we had done of what we had accomplished so it was a really productive period of time I, that, uh, you, know, you were young and enthusiastic about being in the forest entomology business so you probably worked you know more uh, with greater vigor than an old guy would today with that kind of money but it was a fun uh, environment to be in, and one that was really uh, uh, enjoyable uh, experience, and one that was, from a uh, productivity standpoint, was really monstrous. So that's my take on it. I mean, Bob was a, uh, a, a tough taskmaster, and he was a good guy, and he was a forced entomologist. That's my take on it. Right. 
Yeah, uh, I'll throw in a couple of comments too. Um, in some ways, I think I knew Bob less well than, than you guys did. Uh, had a little bit prior experience, certainly Tom had a lot of interaction and experience with him over the years, but my, uh, my impressions of Bob also were of really two things. One of them, a truly really nice man, a really a good person. And the other one was, I liked his science. Uh, one of the things when I was getting started in Southern Pine Beetle research is I was always interested in natural enemies. And I was interested in population dynamics. And Bob was very encouraging and supportive of that. And if you, I went back for this and just kind of reminded myself of some of the kinds of work he did uh, prior to becoming leader in the expanded Southern Pine Beetle program. And he worked with Southern Pine Beetle for his dissertation, which you mentioned was from Auburn, one of the early, I think, uh, members of um, the war conference was his advisor, Lacey <coughs> Hodge from, from Auburn. Uh, so he worked on seasonal development of southern pine beetle, looking at different seasons, with winter, how important winters were, endemic and epidemic populations of southern pine beetle. He worked uh, on claret beetles as predators of southern pine beetle. He worked with, uh, he had some great colleagues to work with in that time with John Mosier. He worked on the variety, the complex of different kind of associate insects that are found with southern pine beetle. So his, uh, his contributions in science were, were good. Uh, a few years back when we were writing the southern pine beetle 2 book, I did a chapter on within tree populations and I went back and started looking at some of the things he found and I realized that there's still so many mysteries about the dynamics of southern pine beetle populations that we don't know and Thatcher was scratching around the edges of these things back in the 60s. One of the things that he found and explained was the fact, or didn't explain, he noticed. We noticed the same thing. And that is, early in the spring of the year, if you climb a southern pine beetle infested pine, the infestation goes up really high, goes up in maybe 20 meters or so, well up into the infested pool. Later in the summer, when that population is growing very fast, trees are being killed, it's a big growing, expanding spot, the populations of southern pine beetle are way lower down in the tree. The top of the infestation may only be 10 meters or eight meters. So there's all this unused resource for these bark beetles. Why is it like that? But he noticed this, we've noticed this. There's just a lot of these unexpected mysteries <coughs> there, but it, to me, uh, he, he had a good inquisitive scientific uh, mind. And he, I think, encouraged those of us working on uh, southern pine beetle populations to, uh, to explore a lot of these things. So, at any rate, I, I haven't, my impression is of, of a very nice person and also a very good scientist. And somebody that liked to have fun. He had a penchant for holding meetings at airport hotels because they always seem to have the, quote, manager's bar. <laughs> we went to a lot of airport hotels for something by people. Air, 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 air host in. Air host in. That's screwed. You guys screwed me every damn time. Because we'd go to dinner and everyone would leave and I wound up getting the bill. I don't know how often you guys did that. The air host in. Okay. So, I mean, I guess I began my career, uh, well, I did begin my career as a postdoc with Bob Colson. I guess that was NSF money that I was Yeah, that's on. exactly right. That was, that was before the expanded Southern Pine Beetle program. Uh, and uh, about the time when people knew that this program was coming about, and a number of universities decided they, uh, they needed to get involved in it. NC State never had a forest entomologist up until that time. And uh, they wound up hiring me and part of the stimulus was the fact that they knew the Southern Pine Beetle program was coming down the road, but uh, there was also stimulus from the Christmas tree industry as well. But about that time, two other universities, University of Arkansas and Mississippi State also hired somebody. So Fred and I and Evan Nebaker all, we started our careers, not the same day, but pretty close. probably the same year anyway. So uh, that's, how, that's how I got started uh, at 
at NC State. And my entire career overlapped the entire expanded Southern Pine Needle program and, and it's uh, uh, the program that they had after that. Uh, being in North Carolina, I also got involved with the Gypsy Moth program. So I, got, I was involved in two of the three programs. You know, one can argue that uh, we had the best leader in, in Bob Thatcher. Uh, but all three of those programs were highly, highly successful. And, and that's, a, that's really what I want to emphasize, is how successful those programs really were. And the, the amount of knowledge that was gained from those programs and then applied into, into management so that we could produce healthier force as a result of that. Those were incredibly successful programs that I, I've always felt was underappreciated uh, as, as time went on. And in fact, in 2006, I wrote a, an article in the uh, Journal of Forestry. Uh, at that time, we were concerned with invasive species. And I wrote my, uh, the, the point I was making there is that we needed a comprehensive approach to invasive species, similar to what was being done in these three big bug programs. We needed good management, we needed resources, uh, and, and we needed uh, uh, user input in, in, into the program. Um, so the question I have is why don't we have these kinds of programs these days? Well, we don't have the money, we don't have the political champions like we had back then, and certainly uh, private industry isn't concerned with some of these, especially with some of these invasive pests. So uh, my journal went, I mean my uh, publication didn't, uh, didn't strike any chord with anybody and well it made and, a lot of people mad okay that's what it did <laughs> good i'll continue to make me mad uh, and so you know and now more recently uh, uh, enrico bonella from uh, ohio state university has uh, also come up with a proposal that's you know and it's along the same lines of pr producing a project that's well a program that's well funded, well managed, uh, and and has long term sustainability. And, and uh, we're probably we're gonna we're gonna have to retweet this a little bit uh, to satisfy this organization. But basically, what what Enrico and I'm on this group too. There's there's a, an entire page of people who have, have signed this document already. Uh, but basically, we want to. We want sustainable uh, and financial support and facilities. We want long-term availability of expert staff of all types and active participation of the stakeholders in monitoring the, the, the program uh, and uh, maintaining a forest ecosystem. And what Enrico was proposing is that these goals can be achieved through the establishment of centers for forest pests he calls them Centers for Forest Pest Control and Prevention within the USDA that would be akin to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. These services would uh, basically work in a cooperative manner to uh, organize all agencies that are interested in, in forest health. Uh, you know, basically be the same kind of program that Bob Thatcher and you other guys got started. I think there's a, you know, another dimension of forest health that's come about recently. You know, we've always emphasized the fact in forest health that uh, we need healthy forests for flood control and wildlife habitat and uh, soil conservation. But there's a there's another dimension that really makes uh, the need for healthy forests critical, uh, very critical, and that is uh, climate change. And there's a, another article that came out earlier this year, maybe many of you saw it. It's from a Swiss scientist, uh, Thomas Crowder, I think, or something like that is his name. And it came, it came out of his lab. There was a, a bunch of uh, authors on, on the paper. They made several conclusions. First of all, they concluded that there's something like, I actually wrote it down here, there's, uh, there is a 4.4 billion hectares of forested land on the earth right now. 
and of the, and there could be another 0.9 billion hectares of uh, land that is forest forestable, reforested, whatever that could be turned into a forest of land. That, this is not agricultural land. It's not urban land. It's actual <coughs> land that, at this point in time, could be forested. And if it were, if there were some sort of a a uh, global reforestation program that would result in 205 gigatons of carbon that would be stored and that would go a long way towards mitigating global uh, climate change uh, but the problem is there's only a window of opportunity there that's relatively small because the climate is changing already and that amount of land that is available for that for forest is also shrinking so you know we are I, I will I would say that we as a society as a society society of this planet and we as professional forest health specialists are fiddling while Rome is burning we're not doing enough and I don't know what it's going to take to do more but we need to have more programs like the Bob Thatcher program and the other two big plug programs. We need more efforts in forest health to establish healthier forests and to maintain healthy forests. I feel like you know it's it's uh, a critical aspect to maintaining a healthy healthy forests are important for a healthy planet. And so, well, I. I well, I'm sitting here listening to you and, and your passion with that. There's a presidential candidate, by the way. Are you supporting him? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted you to know. There is one out here who's a big... Do you all know who that is? The governor of Washington. Yeah. That's just whatever his name is. Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> These are all test questions. Yeah. <laughs> but the, I think that when I sat here and listened to everybody, um, every, every one of us, has been impacted by Bob Thatcher. Um, the seminal ideas that we have, where we've gone with them, careers, as you point out, Bob, uh, positions that people got as a result of the leadership that he provided. And yeah, when you dump a bunch of money in some place and it's targeted to a particular area, you can make hay out of it, okay? In the sense of working on the Southern Pine Beetle, there were population dynamics models developed. There were all kinds of control techniques that were developed. Some are used even today. Assessment models, etc., etc., etc. The biggest impact, the biggest impact that Bob Thatcher had, and the leadership of the other programs is the multiplier effect. I'd like you to think about that right, just for a minute. Think of the multiplier effect of the lives that were touched initially positions that were made available in Arkansas or Florida, Louisiana, North Carolina, Texas, etc. But then think of the countless numbers of students who went through those programs, the countless numbers of students of those students that are still in the game, the numbers of technicians that have been touched, not to mention all the good things that came from it. So you're talking about a multiplier effect that goes far, far, far beyond eight years uh, funding a million some odd dollars. I mean, it's been horrendous and it's still going on. Because there's a lot of people at this conference, for example, that have no idea that their lives were originally stimulated in the game as a result of somebody who was uh, brought on board by the Southern Pine Beetle and this program. It's very yeah. big. I'd, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see a flow chart of that. We don't have it, but I think you would find that there are tremendous numbers of people that are touched by it that don't even know it. Yeah. I, I'd like to make one point here that really speaks to what Fred Hain was talking about. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned here today is uh, there the the concept of integrated pest management was just beginning to formulate. And that was Carl Lovebaker and Perry Atkinson and uh, several other luminary personalities at Berkeley and around the country. Bob Rabb was the, the big advocate. He was at NC State. He was one of the architects of that too. 
But that was the rallying point. No one knew what integrated pest management was, but that was the uh, the the focal point for starting these these big bug programs. We were going to use this new concept called integrated pest management, which was nebulously defined, but that was part of the of the research and actually dealt with developing this concept into something that was real. And Fred, that's what I don't see in terms of, of uh, being able to organize a unless there, there's some some theme that is that can be defined and with with goals and here's here's what we, we would accomplish if we had these centers that you're talking about and I that so that I, I think the, the what's maybe not understood is the absolute importance of that concept of the developing concept of integrated pest management was the rationale for putting the money into these these programs here and i don't see what the new rationale would be um, uh, healthy forests are wonderful but you know what is a healthy forest a happy forest i don't know they, uh, so you know, I, I think that there would have to be some uh, organizing theme that uh, could be developed as a as a a rationale for uh, developing some sort of a new big bike program I, I or guess, something like that. I guess the point I was making that, you know, in, in the past we've always emphasized <coughs> things like soil conservation and uh, flood control and habitat, uh, wildlife habitat preservation, but in addition to that, a much more critical factor is the mitigation of uh, climate change on, on the planet. That would be the organizing factor. I, I, agree. I agree. The problem, I think we all recognize this, is not everybody sees it as a, um, as a sense of urgency. And, and if, goodness, if everybody really believed that what scientific data is showing is true and that there's not much time to bend over and kiss it goodbye, but better get busy. That's a euphemism that some may not know. Um, if people believe that, then you can see this this crisis. Look, at, look how the general public got excited about the potential of a pandemic coming out of China as a result of chickens, uh, what was it, 10? some odd years ago. Everybody was worried that they were going to get this virus that was going to kill them. You got everybody really excited about it. And then it went by the wayside. What's not happening, because people don't believe it, is they don't see an immediate impact on their lives every day. I think if you shut down the air conditioning right now in the southern part of the United States, yeah, you get some attention. <laughs> no, Yuri's, uh, Yuri's uh, paper the other day I hit a, hit a good point, and that is that we in the Southeast really, we may be seeing a little bit of the impact of climate change, but there are other parts of the world that are really being devastated by it. We just don't appreciate that. You know, the big bug programs got their origin for two reasons. One was the forest industry was being economically negatively impacted. Okay, so it was hitting the pocketbook. And that was the case in the South. In the, in the West and the Northeast, you had that happening, plus you had the social pressure of urban and suburban people who didn't like uh, butterfly uh, or moth crap falling in their potato salad. I mean, <laughs> to put it more bluntly. Well, hell, I mean, you got a lot of people that were really ticked off, and that is the political thing. So. We as researchers often think in little boxes. And when you think about manipulating, and that's the fair word to use, manipulating the sources of resources in this country, you have to play the whole gamut of games that are being played out there. And some of it's sensationalism, some of it's reality, uh, some of it's uh, other kinds of things, trickery. I mean. That's how you get this stuff to happen. And if we sit back as researchers, and we need to do this, and I believe in this firmly, and have a strong basis of science that you always can point to to say this is true, that, ha that goes without question. 
But then beyond that, you got to get marketers in there that can grab it, spin it, and twist it to get people's interest. I mean, that's just reality today in this country, unless it's a major crisis. I don't know how else it would happen. Um, and that's sad. You have questions? Maybe, maybe. You yeah, questions, you comments. I want to get back to uh, kind of the beginnings of SRAP. You know, you got this infusion of money. So how was it, who made the decision and how was it decided how to allocate that money and, and how to, who was going to work on what? I mean, we, you had all these universities, and, you know, some worked on biocontrol. Who made those decisions? No, you, you, there, were, there were different coordinators. There was a population dynamics coordinator, a soil site and stand. What were the three or four? Yeah, we, we had uh, we had pop dynamics, we had control, we had uh, I forgot what the other well, one was. Source understand was one of them. That was economics. Right, but the root, but the base question was simply this: What Bob and I did in the very beginning is we formed an advisory committee. Bob Rab was on the committee. Yeah. There had to be people who weren't going to be recipients of any of the resources. So we got a number of notable scientists across the country who agreed to serve on this committee we developed an RFP and call for proposals and they had outlined in it these categories pop dynamics soil and behavior I can't remember I should remember so soil site was, stand was one of them. There were about five four or five and they went out and then those proposals were submitted and we evaluated them through this committee and uh, the first year was pandemonium because we didn't know what those folks could do. We had to allocate that money. Really what we wanted to do is allocate them for three year periods or something and then renewal if they did well. We had to pick two or three of them that we funded outright for three years. We gave them all of the three year money in one year and we hit on every one of them except one guy it's probably good I don't remember his name. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that sucker took the money and ran it and that was all. Yeah. But we had review panels and then they would they would rank it, then it would come back to Bob and I and then later Paul Buffum and we'd make the decisions on who got funded. And then those groups as they formed would come up with a leader of the group, like a pop dynamics group leader, soil leader, etc. And that's how that got going. And then each year those who had been funded submitted for renewals or they were evaluated for renewal and then new proposals were called for as the funds were available so it was kind of like a standard grant funding thing it's the way that happened so uh, how were you you were kind of recruited uh, into the what's your name fred steve i mean they yeah um yeah, I was a brand new assistant professor at Arkansas and realized that the opportunity for doing something with Mark Beadle was there. And I needed to be able to convince my department head that this was a worthwhile thing. Southern Pine Beetle had never really been a problem in Arkansas before, uh, just kind of beginning as a problem. And so there was a little bit of skepticism about, yeah, you know, what, what, what can you do? Why should we really encourage you to do this? And, uh, since I guess I was pretty much the first four entomologists they had, they didn't have a lot of experience to lean on about where, what direction to go. So Bob Thatcher and Tom Payne came up to, to pay us a visit, and uh, it was pretty, pretty funny, actually. <laughs> they uh, went out to dinner and kind of blind and dined them and they I think made a good case that there was there was a good chance that we could be successful in this whole thing and they encouraged our administration but when they left the impression that they they left us with was boy I don't know about the management of this group because they turned in their expenses on a cocktail napkin <laughs> and that was it was a different time and that was <laughs> so, <laughs> so 
no, I guess they didn't get reimbursed. Ultimately, <laughs> we, we did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Fred, how did you come into the program? Uh, well, as, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I was uh, initially uh, hired to, to work on forest on, on Christmas trees, uh, but uh, they knew from the beginning. Uh, that is the university knew from the beginning that there was going to be Southern Pinefield money available. And I had spent uh, 18 months with Bob working on Southern Pinefield population dynamics. And I did a master's on, on Ips Park Beetles. And uh, my PhD was on Christmas trees. So it was, it was almost as if they, had, uh, they knew who I was and, and described the position to fit me, which wasn't the case, but I, I just fit the, the, the job description extremely well. So I got lucky and they hired me. Well, they also part of that job description included it, it, a, that the candidate had to have a degree in forestry. So that, that neck the game down even more. So they, it was a Christmas tree job, a southern pine beetle job. You had to be a forester and they wanted postdoc experience. I mean, you couldn't have written that job that description. That's true. Actually, I wrote it. <laughs> I, I told Fred when, he, when that came out, he said, this is a pure laydown. <laughs> oh, it, it was a real laydown. <laughs> <laughs> was Who was the, Ken was the, was the dean, wasn't he? Department head, Ken Knight was Ken, the Who was the dean? Uh, uh, oh, uh, a guy named Ed Legates. Yeah, right, Legates. So you talked about the oversight of Bob. How did he, uh, you know, the accountability? So what, what measures did he use to well, he oversee the program? In, in our case, I don't know how they treated everybody else, but we, we had a lot of money that, that was was coming in there. The uh, and, and one other thing about the money was is that we thought because it was a five-year program, we had time to do things that, that really took time, like. Uh, we were, were, were collaborating with a group of guys in engineering called the Biosystems Research Group. Modeling was something that, that was just also beginning to surface as a technology or a tool to be used in, in uh, entomology. And these guys were, were engineers, they were modelers, and they came to us and said, well, we want, uh, we have to have developmental rate data for Southern Pine Beetle because the rate functions were going to determine the reality of the model. And I said, I don't want to do that kind of work, but they insisted that we do it. But so there was, they were, the biosystems group was getting money, I was getting money, Tom was getting money. And so there was a lot of, of, of cash coming into Texas A&M. And the way we, my accountability was real simple. They came over, Tom and whoever the other administrators were in, in Thatcher, and sat down and had us review what we had accomplished for every four months for ever. So it was, uh, and you know, they were formal presentations, and we showed them what we were doing, and 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 so it was the most, the most accountable that I've ever been held uh, in terms of doing research was that. But it was uh, site visits, and they were frequent, and uh, so they, if, we, if you weren't using the money properly, or like you said, you're going to, I'm pretty sure it was going away. Seems as though we also had a few uh, conferences that focused on particular topics. For example, on sampling, we had a conference and then there would be a publication that would come out from that. We had one <coughs> on, on modeling and people would contribute, the, the had been participants, and there would be a, a, a booklet or a, a publication that came out on, on modeling components of it. And so you can go back historically and look at the products from the expanded Southern Pine Beetle program, and there, there are lots of little uh, bookmarks like that, that that kind of prove that people actually were doing something. So did y'all have kind of progress report meetings annually, or? Oh yeah, there's annual progress report in addition to, it. and I, I these things were this thick. I'm sure that that's not the, there was, we weren't given any instructions for it, so what you wanted to do was to appear really good. And so these things were documents that were three inches thick. 
pretty certain that they were never read. But most well, no, we read. <laughs> we just recently used Nebuchadnezzar's. Uh, one of his final reports from that SBRAP program. Yeah, it was like, yeah. yeah. And, and Fred, you talked about the little booklets that came out of yeah. the subsection. That's some robust work was in yeah. putting those booklets. So did y'all feel a, a sense of collaboration during the program or was there competition or some, some of both for, you know, the money and well, Bob and I competed for the same kind of things on population dynamics money all the time and the question always was well why should we give you money when we're giving him money and so we would make an argument about the fact that first of all that replication is a good thing we all took slightly different approaches to it and we would, I think, in the end, uh, the collaboration was a lot stronger than the competition because we, yeah. we, we ended up supporting the work that each other was doing. I, I remember some of the administrators in the Forest Service, I didn't feel were terribly understanding of that. I can remember being at a place one night. Some guy, do you remember who that was? I don't know. Uh, came up to me basically and said, tell me what's wrong with what Colson was doing. We're, why would we give money to you rather than to him? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, that's just not right. He does good work. I think I do good work. They yeah. said the same thing to me too. The same guy yeah. asked me what was wrong with friends were. <laughs> I just buy into it. I can't remember who that was. You don't anymore. remember me? No. <laughs> 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 so what do y'all think you know each of y'all can address this uh, kind of the main accomplishments that came out of this I mean you mentioned some of them already but you know you in particular or the program in general uh, yeah, the main accomplishment uh, I, I don't know what the the um, well, your personal I guess you know well what, personally what I mean uh, basically we made it through the professorial ranks uh, is uh, uh, you know it was a glorious time for you know where every land grant every profit land grant university is paid to essentially do three things to hustle bucks publish papers and go to class in that order uh, and the uh, so it was a luxurious life as a as a, as a, uh, a young assistant professor uh, coming into a world where you knew you and they you know, they Texas A&M has always been a hardball game. I mean, they, they, we have always been given huge freedom to pursue research in, uh, in a, across a broad spectrum of topics. You know, I'm doing research on monarch butterflies right now and just published a paper on chimpanzees in Guinea. Uh, so we've been given a lot of, of, of leeway in order to, uh, to be scientists in our programs, but it was always with the understanding that you had to pay the bills. And so this was such a luxurious, you know, front end of our careers, all of us, Fred and Tom, and all of us just really had it easy relative to what you guys in the, in the professorial business are facing today. It's a, there's a lot of money around, but it's in strange places. And there's not, it's, it, the idea of getting a five year project where you could take time to do the study that provided the de developmental rates that were needed for the model, that it, it would be impossible to get that kind of money, that kind of support that they want. I think the main accomplishment of, of, of the program is, a, is the fact that we know how to manage park fields. We know how to manage forests much better than we did. And the park field problem isn't near the problem it was back in the 60s and 70s. Now, part of that is you know, our people took out all the most susceptible trees and, and the southern forests are changing, there's more fragmentation, there's a lot of reasons for it, but at least part of it was due to the fact that we now do a better job of managing our forests and keeping them in a healthier state to minimize our people problems. Right, right, Tom? Yeah, I was thinking, I, I, I think that uh, 
the buckwheat population has gone down because we sampled them all out of the floor. <laughs> when we took these discs, these discs off of these trees, you ever see these discs? I mean, you take enough of those and you take the bark beetles off of the trees, then you lose your population. In all seriousness, I think that the, there are several overarching things that came from this program. One, it set precedent for how big programs could be run focused on major issues that, well, that go well beyond forestry, by the way. The other thing is it developed, uh, and I, I, I made mention of this a little bit earlier, it developed a community of, of collaboration and cooperation across agencies, across industries, and it built uh, partnerships and friendships that yielded lots of good results, not only in scientific endpoints, but in terms of influencing lives of individuals. In terms of specifics, you have sampling schemes that had never been developed before, they've been tested, tried and true, and now you know how you can do that with either uh, populations of beetles or with natural enemies. We learned a lot about the dynamics of the enemy, of the insects and the natural enemies. We learned a lot about soil relationships to tree growth and susceptibility that hadn't been there before. We came up with some techniques for direct control. Mm -hmm. They may not be the best in the world, but they're still being used. And, uh, and we didn't have those before. So there are all of these kinds of things and the associated developments as a result of those major developments, I think, are lasting benefits that can be there. But the overarching thing to me is, is, the, uh, is the interpersonal social interaction that developed as a result of that, that helped provide a basis for a lot of the things that are going on in forestry in general and in forest entomology in particular. He said, any, he said it will. Y'all have any personal stories of your time, you know, during the SWS program that, <laughs> <laughs> that are suitable to uh, relate? I just <laughs> well I wanna I wanna tell one that Bob used the word luxurious a number of times and that you know in his descriptions and so we would have meetings in Nacogdoches and, and Lufkin and everything Bob always rented these big limos that he would drive from College Station over and I always thought of that as being very luxurious. Uh, let me, let me <laughs> the, we, we, we had to, to uh, a &M had contracts with, with rental companies and so we, we did business with the same people all the time and they knew us and uh, so and they had these luxurious cars. Lincoln Continental, they had, the, the one that finally broke the Campbell's back was the, the, the purple Lincoln Continental that we drove over. <laughs> <laughs> but we, they were, we weren't ripped. They, they were upgrading us, so we, we weren't leasing the things. They were just giving to us at the uh, price that we could get. But it didn't <laughs> and, uh, there are so many, oh my goodness, there are so many stories that... Well, it was a fun social time. I mean, it was. And, 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 everybody got along. There were frequent meetings. And there, there, it was a, a good social interaction as well as a, a good scientific. And Bob, Bob and I, Bob and I worked together longer than anybody. I mean, 50 years or so. And when we first got together, Bob was at Texas Forest Service. I was at Texas A&M. The bark beetle thing. We went to Berkeley, and we were hustling with those guys. And he got Pop Dynamics money. I got some pheromone money. Then the Big Blood program came out. And I'll never forget when we were, we got, we had a, a, a moment of tension amongst us at one time. And we were down in Sour Lake, Texas. We used to go down there and we had our field plots and we'd go to May's place, was it? Or the Hayseed? Yeah. And they had these pool tables. And it was probably at the, I thought he was going to kill me one night with a pool cue. You were so pissed off at me. Or was it you were going to cut, the, cut me down out of the no, tree with no, a chainsaw? No. <laughs> <laughs> So we had all these really fun, fun times that we um, we lived through and it built very strong relationships. I will tell you one thing: a guy who isn't here, in which I remember, it was one of the formative meetings of the Southern Pine Beetle Program, and I can't remember exactly where we were. I do remember this part well. We were having a mixer or something, and people were bringing wine to contribute to this, 
and you guys will remember this well. And so we're all in this room and bringing in Dave Culhavy was brand new on the block. And Culhavy comes in, he was just happier than the clam at high tide. He brought in a bottle of wine that had uh, uh, shellfish on the label, which that he got. Muscadet. Yeah, Muscadet that he bought from some truck stop in Nacogdoches, Texas, and he was just tickled shitless that we were going to be <laughs> drinking this great wine, which was, God almighty, this was terrible stuff. <laughs> I would tell that story if Cohavy were here. <laughs> we'll go. Well, we, we wouldn't fund him for five years. <laughs> there's, a, there's a story I, I've told many times about, about Colson. It was when I when I first started working for him. I was I just got my degree from Michigan State, and it was in June. And up in Michigan, we probably hadn't had a temperature that hit 70 degrees yet. And I got down to uh, to Lufkin, Texas, and it was 101. And he had told me about on the phone. He said, "Be prepared to hit the ground running," and, and we did. And the first first day out in the field he had me climbing trees and we probably broke every OSHA rule in the book yeah. as, uh, as I learned how to climb a tree with spikes which I had never done before and so I'm climbing this one tree and I'm going I'm scared to death first of all and I'm going really slow one of the technicians Steve Adams who was super efficient at doing this and he probably sampled 10 trees while I sampled one tree Finally got to the top and finished the tree, and I thought, God, I'm finally done. And Colson yells, there's one more thing. And when we had this rope system where we were pulling up samples and taking them down, and he put something in the bucket, and I pulled it up to see what the hell it was. I thought, what in the hell does he want with me now? And it was a cold beer. <laughs> I, I finished the cold beer, and it took me a half an hour to get out of that tree. <laughs> Oh, that re oh, this is remarkable. So Coster and I had a project in East Texas that we ran all the time, and the weekend was coming, and we wanted to, and we had sampling. We're taking sampling constantly, so we wanted to give a break to our technicians. So we said, take the weekend off. Coster and I would go down, stay in the trailer, we crawl up the trees, and uh, take the samples. And we stopped on the way down and bought a bottle of plot wine, which was spinata. And uh, and so we were we'd been drinking this bottle of spinata, and it came time to go out and climb the tree. And uh, we flipped, and I got the call, so I started up the tree. And I get up there, and my knees buckled, buckled and I sat down on my I sat down on my spikes, and. Uh, that's death. I mean, I, there's no way, I had no strength in my body. I figured, and I'm yelling at Coster, he's passed out somewhere, and I figured they're going to find this dead guy strapped to the tree with his legs blue. And I sat there and sat there, and there was a skag up on the top, and I loosened the belt and got it up over it and had enough muscular strength to raise myself up to come out of that tree. So after that, we wrote a directive to all of our technicians that you could not have plot wine spot during the sampling. <laughs> well, you well, couldn't do that kind of that research anymore. You couldn't climb. You know, Fred did the same thing. You know, he had uh, the sampling protocol involved climbing trees with well, he, everybody had a little bit of a variation of how they did it with a. A, a drill, we did use electric drills with a hole cutting saw on them. You could take the bark samples off, a you know, little technique to doing that. But nobody had a hard hat on. We were sending uh, student technicians up trees, and I did it too, all of us did. Uh, but th there was no sense of, I mean, you, you, you couldn't do it today. First of all, it, some kid would call, well, the other thing is it, it was hard work, and so we took cooler beer out there in the uh, in the field with us and we were through climbing trees in 100 degree weather we'd sit down and have a beer and then drive back in the state truck oh, and, you know I mean, was, you just in this in today's world you just you, you, a you couldn't do it b you couldn't get away with it if you tried to do it and see the fire you so yeah. it was a, a different world altogether back then yeah. that's right. 
real window. We're very lucky that we all stayed employed. <laughs> yeah, I just can't imagine. One of the one of the big products I see that came out of the SPRAP program was the first SPB Bible is what, what we call it. So how did how did that come about and, and what was Thatcher's role, you know, he was the primary editor I guess. You know most about that. Now, what do you guys do? I, I don't know. The primary editor was actually what was it? Janet Searcy was yeah, that? Yeah, 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 she was a professional yeah, editor, right, and right. the result of that was a really good-looking professional book, as yeah. opposed to what the Gypsy Moth folks did, <laughs> where they got this thick book, where you know, a hundred different people made some sort of contribution to it. And it's, I don't know, kind of. Well, they organized it around the, the, the first of the Pine Beetle book. They organized it around those different units: so right. the unit right. of population dynamic soil site and stand risk rating and maybe economics. And so those were the major sections of it. And those of us that participated in each one of those units, like the, the population dynamics unit, uh, uh, we, had, we had chapters in that, or I had chapter in it anyway. And uh, so that's how that whole thing came down. And they contracted it. It's the same, basically the same approach that was used for the Southern Pine Beetle Two book. Yeah. Were the ag all a product of that SPRAP program? You know, the whole series of Southern yeah, Pine Beetle yes. Ag Handbooks yeah. on the different elements yeah. of site stand factors. Yeah. And they, 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 were from, they were working group meetings where, where you got together and where the, 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 that working group would get together and have a symposium and people would contribute papers to it and they would publish that uh, as a proceedings. That's where those things came from. Remember, I'll never forget one comment Janet Searcy made when we were start, starting to write these chapters. Uh, you know, the book was meant to be uh, for the general public, and, and her her comment was, write it as if you were trying to explain something to a ninth grader. Help <laughs> you know, me. And so she she did some heavy heavy ed editing on those books. We couldn't do that. <laughs> I guess uh, now I just kind of wrap things up. Each of y'all maybe can say something about you know your experience with Thatcher and, and with the SWAP program. Kind of summarize you know your. Well, mine was was my, my take on on Bob is I liked him as a person. He was an honest man. He was a forest entomologist. He treated us fairly all the way through that program for the, the 10 years that, uh, that those programs ran. You know, he, I was always treated fairly and honestly. I was treated with, uh, with respect. And uh, I, 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 as an administrator, he did things right. He needed how to do it. And he recognized that he was dealing with, you know, we were kids when this stuff, this stuff was going on. So he, he was. Uh, a good friend and a good mentor and a very good administrator. So I had nothing but admiration for him and God rest his soul. I, I'll kind of echo the, the same the same feelings and add one thing that I said earlier and that is I respect his science. He was very supportive of the science that was being done during that whole thing. This was not just an administrative game. It was, a, it was an effort to get good science done and out to after Bob retired, uh, he, he moved, well I, actually he, uh, he retired as an AD and he was already in Asheville. And uh, so he, he stayed in Asheville during his retirement and he, he was a volunteer for the Forest Service for doing various jobs for a long time too. Uh, and, and so I would run into him periodically and then one day he, uh, he called and said he's kind of cleaning out his, his home and he had a bunch of professional books that he wanted to contribute to, to NC State. And so uh, his private collection of professional books are located in Grinnell's lab at, at NC State University to this day. Uh, that's good. That's good. Well, um, <coughs> Bob was a reluctant administrator. That wasn't his deal. And as Bob has said, he was a good guy. 
I spent lots and lots and lots of time with him, and we became very good friends. Uh, God, I could just think when we, we decided we were going to jog, and uh, we used to jog up and down the stairs in the air host stand in Atlanta, where we were at. We'd stay a week and meet with all these research groups that would come in to have meetings and stuff, and Bob and I would put on our jogging shorts, and his jogging shorts looked like uh, old men in long underwear, and we went <laughs> down the stairs together, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking, smoking cigars together, and all of that stuff. What Bob means to me is that I, um, I was starting to get more administrative-like in the things I was doing. I've always been an organizer, even when I was a little kid. And uh, Bob kind of encouraged me uh, about that. And uh, several opportunities began to present themselves to me while I was the research coordinator for the Southern Pine Beetle Program. And I know that Bob played a role in that. I was nowhere near to become an administrator, not that I've ever even done very well at it, but I sure as hell wasn't capable of doing it then. But I learned a lot from him. Compassion, caring, the biggest thing is caring for people. If you don't invest in people, you're missing the boat. I mean, that's where the final analysis is. You invest in people because that's what makes the clock go around. That's what Bob did. And uh, I think his lasting impact, and you heard that from everybody here, he was a nice guy and they cared for him and they liked him. And as a result of that, good things happen. And that's a great legacy. That's a great legacy. I guess we have time for questions. If we've got these guys up here. Anybody has any questions about the program or Bob? Yeah, no. Um, what was the official duration of SBRAP? From what year did it begin? What year did it end? That's a great question. Um, the first one, I think, was in, began in 73, I think it was. We started funding in 74, was it? And then we had it for four years, but it got renewal before the thing ended, and then it became the expanded one. Yeah, uh, it, I it, it was the, 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 no, it became the IPM program. It expanded, SPRAP was the, the, the first program, and I thought that ran five years. Yeah, okay. And then uh, uh, it was, I, I, my recollection was it was probably 74, and then as soon as that was over, uh, at the end of that five years, the program became the IPM program, and that went another five years. And, uh, so it would have been basically 74 to 84 is the, is the time frame. Yeah. So did, was Bob Thatcher involved in the second IPN? Was he still in the yeah. same position? Yeah, same, same, same position, the same model. The, yeah. uh, the, 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 the personalities changed. I mean, Tom rotated off and Bill Lucier would come in and Paul Buffum and there were different... Uh, Jerry and Jack. Pertel was part of it, Earl Mason was, Jack was, so the, 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 the lieutenants that worked with Bob changed over that 10-year period. He did. You know, there's something I forgot that, that is really important. During this period of time, the USDA started a program called CARGO, Competitive Research Grant Summer, rather. I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it was called CARGO. And basically it was a competitive grants program targeted mostly to land-grant universities, but anybody could apply uh, across the board. So it could be any kind of subject dealing with agriculture. But within that program, there was one targeted specifically to the Southern Pine Beetle, and only the Southern Pine Beetle. And it was a pretty good chunk of money. Uh, I can't remember, it was 300, 800, some odd thousand dollars. And that was put in there during the time that we had this program going on. It was stuck in there by Jamie Whitman and I think Thad Cochran out of the South. And that provided a source of funding that went in to work on the Southern Pine Beetle. The people who managed the program didn't like that. They wanted that money to be put in with the rest of it. But because of our connections with people in the South, 
managed to maintain that uniqueness for quite a long time, which funded a lot of our projects too. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that, that that was made possible in part because of the, the Southern Pine Beetle program and, and Bob's leadership. I think a real good thing that came out was really to make a lot of the research more applied to I mean, working with the forest health staff and states and things like that. The ag handbooks, I mean, gosh, they're still out there today, you know, uh, and used. Uh, so was there one person in charge of like the tech transfer or did all of y'all kind of? It, the way it was set up is that it was called a research and application program. And the idea was you had a research coordinator and an application coordinator. And the application coordinator's responsibility was to work on that side of the house. So the first one was Paul Buffum, and then the second one was Jack and on the application side. I don't know what went on after that. Uh, I don't remember. But that was their responsibility, was to coordinate and move that stuff along. Well, there were a ton of, uh, of technical review, peer review papers that came out of that program. The um, yeah. uh, and uh, and I, you know, when we summarized the uh, uh, did the Southern Pine Beetle Two book, uh, I looked at a lot of that was uh, was basically the idea was to uh, uh, the Southern Pine Beetle Two book was to provide an interpretation of the new uh, discoveries that had been made since the 1980 book. I think that thing was published in 1981. When was yeah. 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 And, uh, the, it was there, uh, so I reviewed a lot of the, 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 the literature that was associated with the first book, and there were a ton of technically reviewed papers that came out of that program. I mean, basically, we made our careers off of that money. Yeah. yeah. The papers that we got out of. Yeah. Any other questions? Final comments from the uh, well, th Thanks for doing this, Stevie. Well, I'd like to thank our panel here for attending again. You know, this is a rare opportunity to get these guys together and hear about, you know, those experiences way back in the 70s. Yeah, so I was just sitting here pondering. Last year you did the Southern, Southern Forest Entomology by Steve Clark and uh, soon to be released and this year it's a tribute to uh, R.C. Thatcher by Steve Clark. Um, who are you going to do? What are you going to do next year? I'm trying to ponder what, what's, what's it going to be. You know, it's Steve Clark on Steve Clark. He'll be done. He'll be done. <laughs> It'll be a tribute to his career. <laughs> Well, uh, we would do one for you, but no, no, we I, want I, people to attend. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, what, are you going to, uh, now you videoed the last one, yeah. right? Yes. And are you going to, like, put them together into something? Um, yeah, that's the plan. I've okay. edited that one together, and it's, you know, we just need an outlet for it. You know, YouTube. America is funny. As the, no, uh, yeah, YouTube is probably where it's going to go. YouTube would be great. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know if we wanted to try to establish like a Sifwick YouTube channel to put videos and oh, that's different things in it. Yeah, that would be a where I foresee yeah, it going. That book with the fellow that talked in the yeah. session this morning would be the person to. Uh, yeah. So we're already working right there. Right. Yeah. yeah, so if we could you know, establish something like that as part of the book, you had a Sifwick book. You'd, 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 you'd add it, right? <laughs> yeah. Some Your face will be covered. <laughs> Some of us are still indictable. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little black bar over there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I'd like, again, I really appreciate you guys being willing to attend and, and discuss that program. And let's give them a big round. Of applause.